China and Western countries have been squabbling over exchange rates for years. The United States and many other countries accuse China of buying dollars to keep China's currency weaker than it would be otherwise. That makes Chinese goods cheaper in other countries, and it makes it more expensive for the Chinese to buy from foreigners. In the United States, politicians and regulators say China's policy undermine exports, costing American jobs. Knowledge at Wharton has invited Professor Franklin Allen, professor of finance, to explain what's at stake and why this conflict is so hard to resolve. Uh, the first thing I, I, that I've noticed in this is that uh, the China currency issue is one of the few things that Democrats and Republicans seem to agree on. And I'm curious whether you believe that China's manipulating its currency. So I think manipulation is an emotive word. They're doing what many countries have done through much of history, which is to fix their exchange rate relative to another currency. And through much of the Bretton Woods period, of course, this is what pretty much every country did. It's what the Europeans are doing to an extreme degree in the euro, but it's not too much different than what they did in the exchange rate mechanism before the euro was introduced. And it's not too much different from what the entrants into the euro have to do before they actually enter properly and fix um, the exchange rate. So I, I think manipulation is the wrong word. They're fixing their exchange rate for sure. And uh, I gather that the, the, the intent is to keep uh, the Chinese currency weaker uh, in, in, in relation to the dollar. Uh, or is that, is that right? And, and what's, the, what's the reason for doing that? How do they benefit? So this is a complicated question. Originally, I think it's for the same reason that European countries wanted the euro. If you, if you want to export, it's good to have a fixed exchange rate. And China thought that this was something that was beneficial for them some time ago. Over time, we've evolved, and I think we're now in, in a rather different position. So originally, they didn't run big surpluses. They didn't have big reserves. But then what's happened over time is that particularly after the Asian crisis, many countries have built up big reserves. So the Chinese are by no means the only ones. If you look at the smaller countries like South Korea and countries like that, they've also built up reserves. I think there are many reasons for that. Part of it was that the way that the IMF treated Asian countries in the 1997 Asian crisis led them to believe that because the governance structure is dominated by the Europeans and the Americans, the Asians don't get a fair look in. And I think their response to that has been, we need to have reserves instead. And this is one big reason for the reserves. I think for the Chinese, in addition, they've realized over time that reserves give them a very great deal of political power with respect to the U.S. So when President Obama goes to visit, he's very polite. He doesn't mention too many things about human rights and so forth because we owe them two and a half trillion. The other reason, which is the one that's given a lot of play in the press, is that by doing this by keeping the exchange rate low, they're making it easier for their exporters. And I think there's some truth to that, but I think that it's much more complicated than is usually presented. And, and just give us a couple examples of what are the complicating factors that we don't usually consider. Well, I think when the US or the Europeans say what you need to do is to let it move, it's not clear what the, the, the short-term rate would be or the medium-term rate or the long-term rate if they simply allowed it to float. It's true that there's a deficit on the current account at the moment. That's been there for a few years now. But there's also the capital account. And whereas I'm sure there's lots of money wanting to get into China because they perceive the RMB to be a strong currency, I think that the reverse is also true. There's a lot of money that wants to get out of China. First of all, Chinese people don't have many instruments to invest in, and that would give them some money more if they could take their money out. And also, of course, there's the political reason that if you want to hedge the risk, if you think that we may have problems in China going forward, then also they may want to take money out. In the short run, it's not clear which of those balances would dominate. And in the medium term, the long run, 
it's not so clear either, given differences in inflation rates and so on. So it, it's more complex than it's portrayed. My own view is that probably in the long run, the RMB will strengthen, and it probably is a good long-term invest in, investment. So I think the, 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 there would be differences from now. If the Western view is, is often overly simplified, I'm just curious whether it's possible the Chinese view is overly simplified as well. Well, the problem is now, I think, you know, if you take the long run view, it's ironically, both countries are on the wrong side because what the Chinese essentially are doing is giving us goods, real things, for pieces of paper, in other words, dollars. We're getting to consume it. They're getting pieces of paper whose value is very uncertain in the long run. Even if you think that there will be a revaluation of 20%, given their reserves are now about 50% or more of GDP, if we had a 20% appreciation in the RMB, they're going to lose about 10% of GMP. This is an enormous loss for them. It's about the same as the trade for a year. Their net contribution of trade is about 10% of GDP. So this is a sense in which they're running a big risk, but it's also the sense in which when we say, okay, you need to let it float, what we're doing is essentially going against our consumer interests. People always talk about jobs and the necessity of saving jobs, but these are relatively short-term interests, at least in normal times, compared to these long-run interests of them giving us goods at below price and us giving them dollars in, in exchange. Now, uh, the, the mechanics of influencing exchange rates is more complex than just saying this is what we want it to be. Uh, can you just briefly give us a glimpse into how it's done? It's purchasing U.S. Treasuries or whatever it is. This process. So essentially, they go out and they purchase U.S. Treasuries. Oh, so what happens is there's either current account surplus or some inflow of dollars into, the, into China. So the central bank gets dollars and they give people who have exported, say, RMB in exchange. They then go out and sterilize those, which means they increase bank reserves or they sell government bonds so they don't have inflation in China. And what the net result of all this is, is that they end up with a lot of foreign reserves and they have offsetting debt. Now, in the long run, as I say, this is not good for them. It's very risky. And what they need to do is to change it, to get rid of this process and move towards having the RMB as a reserve currency. We need the RMB to be like the euro and the dollar and for them to be able to behave in the same way that the US and the Euro Europeans do. They don't need reserves if they have a reserve currency. And that will make everything much easier and avoid all these problems that we've been talking about. And this process that you've described, uh, the, the, the result in the end is that it, it affects the balance of supply and demand of dollars, uh, and, and that, that affects the exchange rate. It does, exactly. Th this issue is, is one of those things that, that sort of comes up, you hear about it, it's a big thing in the news, uh, there may be some meeting or some uh, U.S. official will give a speech and there's a, we're all in a tizzy for a while and then it kind of dies down and then it comes back again. How important is it really? So I think the exchange rate issue in itself is not that important in the medium term. I think in the long run, it's very important they move to being a reserve currency. But the problem is we've now got politics involved. And the Americans and the Europeans demanding that the Chinese change their policies is not a good way to go because the Chinese won't do it simply for the reason that we're asking them to do it. I think they realize that in the long run they need to move towards having the RMB as a reserve currency. They're doing many things in that direction. For example, they're beginning to clear trade in RMB. They're allowing RMB issues in Hong Kong by foreign corporations like McDonald's. These are all moves towards having the RMB as an international currency. The one thing that remains is to have 
an open capital account and a completely flexible exchange rate. They know that they should do that, but the more we tell them to do it, the less likely they're going to do it. A good example of how much they dislike being told what to do was provided by the border dispute that they're having in the East China Sea, in particular with Japan, and the fact that they were so strident in canceling the visit by the thousand youths to Shanghai high for the expo by the prime minister making speeches after a very short time shows how willing they are to be aggressive in these kinds of issues and i think if we try and push them we won't be able to and our position is basically the weaker one because we're the ones that owe them the two and a half trillion if they start selling and moving money into euros or into any of these other currencies we're quite vulnerable i think no, nobody likes to be bullied. Right, and the Chinese have 150 years of being bullied by the West, and this is something that they feel very strongly about. In the West, I, I sometimes wonder whether uh, blaming China for, for problems is just a convenient way of not admitting that you're causing your own problems. Is, is that part of what's going on here? What do you I think, think that is part of what's going on here, I think. We don't save enough. We rely too much on being able to issue, issue dollars and borrow. And this is a long-run problem. We need to start being more like the Germans and being more fiscally responsible. And hopefully these problems will then go away. I, I don't think we are doing our part. We're trying to insist that the Chinese do theirs. But I, I think we've got into this very bad position now. And what do you think are the prospects that this could escalate into a trade war and a protectionist era that, that would be damaging to everybody? I think it's quite likely that we will get into a situation not of trade wars. I think that the, the, the WTO is sufficiently strong that whereas we won't make much progress, I don't think we'll go backwards. But I do think it's quite likely that governments will start intervening as they already have done in Japan and many other Asian countries, and that this is not a good thing. We're already printing too much money with quantitative easing. The last thing we need is for these Asian countries to also be printing money to keep currencies down. And if you were to look around the world and say, you know, this is the organization or the country or the head of state or whatever that is in a position to do something to break this logjam, uh, who would that be? I think the Americans and the Europeans need to back off on this issue. I think the people who can solve it in the long term is the next generation of Chinese leaders. So when the new president and the new prime minister come in, I think that they will hopefully look very hard at this problem, realize that having the RMB as a reserve currency is a very important thing in the long run for China and that they will then go about dismantling these exchange controls and having it float. But we're a long way from there, unfortunately. We'll have to be very patient, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff.